All right, welcome everybody. Welcome everyone at home. Um, welcome to our panelists. You are at the event Waging Peace, Canada, US uh, and Russia's war in Ukraine. And today we're joined by Medea Benjamin and Dimitri Lascaris. My name is Bianca Mujeni. I'm with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, the host and organizer of today's event. And you can find out more about our work at foreignpolicy.ca. And we're an organization that challenges unjust uh, foreign policy measures. Uh, the Institute is based in Montreal, or Jojage, which is on the traditional territory of the Ganyangehaga people and the keepers of the Eastern Door of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. We also recognize the continued presence of the Métis, Innu, and Inuit people on this land. So thank you for joining us today. Um, please do let us know where you're coming from. Um, the chat is open. After speakers um, give their remarks, we're going to take about half an hour for questions from the audience uh, following that. So please do put your questions in the Q&A. So today's event is called Waging Peace, Canada, US, and Russia's War in Ukraine. And the CFPI believes that Russia's terrible invasion of Ukraine must be condemned as an immoral and flagrant violation of international law that is causing immense suffering and death. Um, we've seen eight long months of war that could very well escalate uh, into something even more awful, and uh, it needs to end. We also have to consider the role of our own government uh, in this calamitous situation and any responsibility that we bear uh, for the suffering experienced by innocent Ukrainians. So we must strive for instance to understand Canada's role in the 2014 overthrow of the elected Ukrainian president, which was an event that spurred war uh, in the east of the country. Um, Canadian press reported that anti-government protesters were stationed at the Canadian embassy in Kyiv for a week um, during the protests in 2014 that ousted Yanukovych. Through the Operation uh, unifier training mission, Canada has arguably uh, been in a proxy war with Russia since 2015, um, with one aim of this training mission um, to bring the Ukrainian military into NATO. So as many have pointed out, uh, factor driving regional tensions in NATO is NATO expansion um, across Eastern Europe. Um, and since the early 90s, Canada has pushed to expand NATO to Russia's doorstep despite promises to Soviet officials not to do so. Since February 24th, Canada has promoted further NATO expansion and increased its already significant troop levels in Latvia and elsewhere in Eastern Europe. So it's hard to see how Canada is not de facto at war with Russia, with special forces on the ground, Canadian training, uh, Ukrainian forces in the UK, with promotion of former soldiers to join the Ukrainian military, and $700 million sent in weaponry. So in order to find a way out, we really do have to come to terms with the history of this war. Instead of further fueling the conflict, we are calling on Ottawa to push to negotiate a way out of it. Um, until now, Ottawa has spurned negotiations, but without an end to this war, more Ukrainians will die and the possibility of cataclysmic nuclear war will grow. And so that is why um, we are so thrilled uh, to have our two guests here with us, Medea Benjamin and Dimitri Laskaris, who have been speaking out. Um, and the first uh, guest of the evening, it's my great pleasure to introduce Medea Benjamin. Medea is the co-founder of the women-led peace group Code Pink. She's the author of 10 books, including her latest, War in Ukraine, Making Sense of a Senseless Conflict, which we'll be hearing more about uh, tonight. Welcome, Medea. Thank you so much, Bianca. And excuse me for my bad internet, uh, here in the first world, United States, um, we just had a fire outside and it, and it took the internet down. So I hope uh, you can hear me okay, right? We can. I can hear you great. Okay, very good. So I'm so delighted to be with you. It's really so important that we cross borders these days. And just hearing your introduction, Bianca, and looking at the stance that your organization has taken, uh, I feel very much at home uh, with what you say. Uh, we too at my organization, Code Pink, have been uh, it, it condemning the Russian invasion from the very beginning and uh, calling it unjustified, illegal, immoral. Uh, we are, are heartbroken to see all the destruction, uh, all the lives that have been lost and, uh, and the devastation. Um, we also 
uh, like you, think it's very important that we recognize the role of our own government, and especially in the United States, where we feel that NATO is an organization that really revolves around the United States. Uh, in the U.S., one of our problems uh, as Code Pink, when we joined uh, over a decade ago, a group called No to NATO, is that the American people didn't even know what NATO was. And so uh, when they did, they thought it was a defensive alliance. And of course, that's how it's been posed to the American people. Uh, in our book, we have an entire chapter talking about how NATO is not a defensive alliance. It's an aggressive military alliance. And not only should have it been disbanded at the time the Warsaw Pact was disbanded, uh, uh, but it also has a history of uh, expanding beyond the Atlantic. I mean, certainly the uh, involvement of NATO in the invasion of Afghanistan had nothing to do with the Atlantic, uh, involvement of NATO in the invasion of Libya. And now we see NATO so deeply involved in uh, this war in Ukraine, but we also see it setting its sights on China, which I think is important that we recognize uh, that it's, um, it, it really is looking towards uh, Russia and China as adversaries that must be weakened. Um, we also see the U.S. involvement in NATO as a way to subjugate Europe to the dictates of U.S. policy. And uh, this is uh, so clear today. Uh, we look at the uh, expansion of NATO as something that is deeply provocative to the Russians. Uh, we have so many U.S. officials and people in the military, and we quote them in our book extensively, that warned again and again and again that the expansion was a provocation, that it would result in a, a potential war with Russia. And here we are today with so many people in the U.S. denying that NATO uh, was provocative. Uh, when we have all of those warnings dating back uh, to the early um, 1990s when uh, the U.S. first promised that it would not expand to uh, Russia's eastern border. Uh, then there is the issue that you mentioned in the introduction about the, uh, the uh, 2014 coup. And, you know, here in the United States, we have been seeing how the Democrats uh, since the time that Hillary Clinton lost the election to Donald Trump, uh, talking about Russian interference in U.S. elections. And it's very questionable the extent to any interference. And I think many of us recognize that Hillary Clinton was just a bad candidate. Um, but in any case, there is so much overt interference by the United States in the internal affairs of Ukraine in that 2014 uprising that turned into a coup. And uh, so uh, we think it's important to detail uh, that involvement and how that led to uh, the uh, civil war in the Donbass uh, and uh, of course, Russia taking over Crimea. Um, we feel that um, today when you look at the uh, the, the war in Ukraine, uh, it's important to look at it as two wars going on simultaneously. There's the civil war in the Donbass and, and then the Russians coming in in February as an aggressor. And then there's the geopolitical war that has been going on where our governments, the US, Canada, the Western uh, European states have been very much uh, uh, dangerously uh, setting the stage for what unfortunately turned into this invasion. Uh, I don't know if you followed so much in Canada what was a major um, uh, kerfluffle is probably a, not the right word, maybe something a little stronger than that, when 30 members of the U.S. Congress last week came out with a letter calling for negotiations. These were members of the Progressive Caucus. Now, 30 members is a very small number, given we have 435 members of Congress. Um, but in any case, it was a start of people who were peeling off from the Democratic Party and saying negotiations were important. 
until then, the only opposition in Congress to uh, the U.S. massive support of weapons to Ukraine, which is now over $60 billion, has been coming from the extreme right in the Republican Party. In fact, when there was a a $40 billion package uh, for Ukraine, not one Democrat opposed it, while 57 Republicans in the House and 11 senators uh, opposed it. So we've been working hard to try to get Democrats to start questioning uh, this blank check for uh, uh, for Ukraine and the lack of support for negotiations. And so when these 30 congressmen came, uh, Congress people came forward, uh, we were very excited about it, except that the backlash was incredible. Now, let me be clear, this letter was an extremely mild letter. It did not uh, call for an end to military aid. On the contrary, it thanked uh, President Biden and the Congress for its uh, steadfast support for Ukraine and their resistance, but it said that that should be paired with negotiations. And for some reason, in today's atmosphere within the Democratic Party, calling for negotiations is being seen as pro-Putin, as appeasement, uh, and as not Uh, falling behind a Democratic president, especially when elections are around the corner. And so those Congress people rescinded their letter within 24 hours. Uh, I don't know that there's a history of that being done before when a letter was signed, sealed, and delivered, uh, and then rescinded. Uh, So it shows how, um, uh, how much adversity there is uh, in the Democratic uh, Congress Uh, to just the idea of talks. And um, much of the criticism of those Democrats was that you can't talk to Putin. And we think it's important to take that issue on uh, very um, directly. Uh, There was the incident in uh, March where the two, where Ukraine and Russia were talking, uh, mediated by Turkey, and it looked like there were positive results in that talk until Boris Johnson interfe- intervened and U.S. Secretary of Defense uh, uh, Lloyd Austin intervened and basically said to Ukraine, uh, we don't want to see negotiations. We want to see this war carried out until victory. And the goalposts were changed from defending Ukraine against Russian aggression to weakening Russia. Uh, we do think that there is Uh, are real possibilities of talks, uh, and that is because there have been negotiations on selective issues, such as the grain negotiations, which were successful in getting many thousands, in fact, almost 10 million tons of grain out of Ukraine. Uh, That that deal, um, uh, Russia pulled out and then uh, went right back into it because there was international pressure to do so. Uh, The nuclear plant, the Zaporizhia plant, the largest nuclear plant in Europe, uh, when there was tremendous concern over the shelling that both sides were accusing each other of, there were negotiations to get the International Atomic Energy Association into the plant, and that was successful. And there have been almost 20 prisoner swaps that have happened uh, since the February invasion. And those take a lot of negotiations, a lot of trust building to make those happen. So we feel that it is the height of irresponsibility uh, for Medea, our government. Medea, can I just ask you to switch on your video? I think that it's um, it's switched off for some reason. I think it might have to do with the internet. I'm wondering if you could just take a yeah, moment to switch it back on. It's just not working. Oh, really? Okay. Hopefully, okay. hopefully it'll come on again soon. I'm so sorry about this. It looks like it's, yeah, it looks like it's, if you could just keep checking it, that would be great. Cause right now it's saying that it's switched off. Um, but yeah, please proceed. Okay. Uh, so um, we feel that it's a height of irresponsibility for uh, Biden to refuse to talk to Putin. In fact, at the G20 meeting coming up in Indonesia, uh, we have been pushing for the two leaders to talk to each other. Uh, And the U.S. Secretary of State, who is supposed to be the number one diplomat in this country, 
has not had any talks with his counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, in, in Russia. On the contrary, he's been traveling around the world trying to uh, get more arms com uh, weapons committed to go to Ukraine. So um, we are, are part of, of course, a much larger uh, grouping around the world that is calling for negotiations. Um, it is not just the Ukrainians who are affected by this war, and there are a growing number of Ukrainians who are pro-negotiating as well as we see in recent polls that have come out. Um, there is the opposition within Russia. Uh, we, we saw when the Russian government uh, declared that it was going to call up 300,000 more recruits uh, that this led to increased resistance inside Russia and many of those uh, military aides fleeing the country. Uh, greater protests happening in Europe than are happening in the United States right now um, with many of the European uh, protests being led by the extreme right, some of them being left and right together. And um, there are... Uh, uh, tremendous calls from the global south calling for there to be a solution. Um, my colleague and I who wrote the book together looked at every single um, speech that was given at the United Nations during the last General Assembly. And there were 66 heads of state uh, who called on both sides to come together at the negotiating table, uh, particularly um, uh, uh, heartfelt were the calls by um, a, uh, some of the leaders of the small island nations whose nations are facing uh, extinction with the climate crisis, saying that the wealthier countries were supposed to have put $100 billion into a climate fund uh, in the last decade, um, and they haven't done that. In the meantime, they've spent over $100 billion in Ukraine in less than a year. Uh, so a question of what are our priorities and where is all this money going? Um, I think that as we uh, look forward, uh, one of the dilemmas here in the United States is do those of us who consider ourselves progressive on so many issues make common cause with some of the extreme right people? Uh, and Donald Trump himself, who has been calling for negotiations and warning about the potential of a, a nuclear war? Um, do we make common cause with them uh, or do we build up from within the progressive movement, those people who are working on the climate issues and uh, should be aware of how devastating this war is for the climate with more dirty energy uh, being uh, produced as a result of the sanctions on Russia uh, and, of course, all of the environmental devastation that comes with war itself. Um, we think it's important to get the uh, faith-based communities in the United States uh, to listen to the Pope and other global leaders who have called for negotiations. Uh, and um, at the um, COP27 meeting that is going to take place in Egypt uh, starting on uh, November 6th, um, we are hoping that uh, there will be calls by some of our organizations while we were there um, to show the connections between the environment uh, in, in crisis and the um, and this war in Ukraine. So I want to end by saying that, uh, unfortunately, um, in the United States, uh, we are just in the beginnings of building up a strong anti-war movement that can get people out in the streets that can put effective pressure on our elected officials. Uh, we hear that during the next, uh, after the elections in that short window before the next Congress takes uh, its seat, there will be another bill for $50 billion going to Ukraine that will have made over $100 billion from the US alone. Uh, and we have to build up opposition to that uh, and, um, so we are uh, delighted to be hooking up with you, uh, and hopefully in the discussion we can talk about more ways that our countries can work together uh, to push forward on this call for uh, what we know is the only way this war will end, which is at the negotiating table. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Medea. Thank you for those inspiring words and um, for all of those important details. I do invite our audience members to grab a copy of Medea's book. It's getting terrific reviews. Chris Hedges, uh, author and journalist, says war in Ukraine makes tragically clear that this was a conflict that could have been avoided if our foreign policy had not become captive to militarists whose sole loyalty is to the arms industry. Uh, Noam Chomsky writes of war in Ukraine, this careful, informed, judicious, judicious study is an invaluable guide to understanding Russia's criminal invasion of Ukraine and most crucially how we can act to help bring this terrible tragedy to an end. So it's hot off the press from OR Books and uh, it's available to purchase. I did put the link in the chat and I'll put it in the replay as well for people at home who are not watching live. It's at orbooks.com. Uh, slash catalog slash war uh, in Ukraine. Okay, and for those of you who are asking, yes, uh, we will be rebroadcasting this discussion to both YouTube and to Facebook. Um, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel because um, you'll get immediate, immediate notifications that way. I also want to remind people that we will have a Q&A after this, so please do uh, start putting your questions in the Q&A box. Thanks again to Medea. I'm really looking forward to reconnecting with you in, uh, in the discussion portion of the evening. All right, so our next panelist of the evening uh, is also well known to many of you. Uh, Dimitri Lascaris is a lawyer, human rights activist, and former candidate for the leadership of the Green Party of Canada. He is based in Montreal, um, and you can follow him on Twitter at Dimitri Lascaris. Welcome, Dimitri. Thank you, Bianca. It's a pleasure being here, and uh, always a pleasure being uh, in a discussion with Medea as well. Um, so. I, I, I start from the position that a humane and effective response to this or any other war requires uh, a fact-based, realistic understanding of the causes of the war and the challenges confronting the belligerent parties, both militarily and economically. And you can't formulate an effective and humane response to any conflict without starting there with the facts about those challenges and the causes. And in my opinion, there are two fundamental realities about this war which should form the basis of our government's response to it. First of all, NATO provoked it. And second, Ukraine cannot win it. And I'm going to explain why I take those positions. Uh, and let me state at the outset, I unequivocally oppose this war, uh, just as I oppose all war. Uh, and my overarching objective as an activist, uh, a journalist, a politician, as a public interest advocate, is to help in any way that I can to find a way to bring this war to an end as quickly and as peacefully as possible. But like any problem, you can't solve this problem without understanding what caused the problem. Now, Medea has touched upon some of these issues, and I don't want to uh, repeat some of the things that she said, but of course, NATO's 2008 promise, and it was a promise to accept both Ukraine and Georgia into NATO, violated assurances that were given to Gorbachev uh, at the time of German reunification, uh, and also disregarded many warning, warnings from luminaries in the foreign policy community in the West, especially the United States. Uh, and in fact, you know, it's been contested that uh, by some that there were such assurances given, but all you have to go, do is go look at the, uh, the National Security Archive in Washington, which is written about this extensively. And it describes what happened at that time as a cascade, a cascade of assurances not given not just by the United States government, <laughs> but by a broad range of NATO powers that NATO would not expand one inch eastward. And I want to say about this, you know, one of the arguments that you're often met with is, well, NATO has a right, uh, Ukraine has a right to join NATO. Uh, no, it doesn't. NATO is an exclusive club. Article 10 of the treaty confers upon each and every member state the right to veto the admission of a new member. And in fact, this is what we're seeing now with Sweden and Finland. Uh, Turkey, all by itself, is holding up their admission uh, into NATO. Any country can do that. The whole purpose of any country being a member of this military alliance is ostensibly to enhance that country's security. And if the government of the country in question, a NATO member, decides that admitting somebody into NATO would undermine that country's security, and clearly <laughs> admitting Ukraine into NATO would not enhance the security of Canada, uh, then they are perfectly un entitled under Article 10 of the, 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 the NATO Charter to say no. So Ukraine has a right to ask. It doesn't have a right for its request to be granted. And uh, I would go so far as to say that Canada, in fact, uh, doesn't 
acquire any security benefits from membership in NATO. Uh, quite apart from Ukraine's membership, there are countries in the alliance, the Baltic states, Poland, and so forth, in Eastern Europe, which have a highly belligerent relationship with Russia. And the, the prospect of them going to war and Canada being obliged under Article 5 of NATO Charter to come to their defense is much higher than the prospect of uh, Canada, which uh, you know lies to the north of the United States and uh, is closely allied to the world's most militarily powerful country being attacked by a foreign army. Uh, and so we actually, uh, as, a, as a country, we're having our security undermined by NATO membership, not to mention the fact that we're spending inordinate amounts of money on the military uh, because of uh, the 2% of GDP uh, guideline within NATO spending. Now, uh, as Medea mentioned, there was also a coup in 2014. Uh, you know, many of us have listened to a tape involving a senior State Department official, Victoria Newland, and Jeffrey Payette, who was at the time the ambassador to Ukraine for the United States. Mm -hmm. And in it, they are planning, they are actually deciding who is going to be the next prime minister of Ukraine uh, before uh, Yanukovych, the duly elected president of Ukraine, was re removed uh, from power effectively by right-wing violence. And the person in question did, in fact, become the prime minister of Ukraine. Now, imagine if this was done by Russia in the United States or in a country bordering on the United States. No one, no one would question for one second that there had been illegitimate interference in, uh, in American affairs or uh, in, in the affairs of whatever country that is allied to the United States where this type of thing went on. Uh, but for some reason, uh, many people in the West seem to think it's okay for us to engage in this kind of uh, naked interference in the affairs of a state that's bordering upon Ru Russia. In 2014 as well, uh, the right sector, which is a neo-Nazi organization, burned alive dozens of pro-Russian pro uh, protesters in the House of Trade Unions in Odessa. You can imagine, after the horrors of World War II at the hands of the Nazis, the impression that this made upon not just the Russian government, but the Russian people at the time. Then subsequently, there were the Minsk Accords, under which uh, the, 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 the uh, Donbass and Luhansk were not guaranteed separation from Ukraine. That was not the plan. The plan was that they would be given a limited degree of autonomy within Ukraine, taking into account their uh, relatively different cultural and linguistic characteristics. And that promise of autonomy was never granted. Ukraine violated the Minsk Accords, and there was really no pressure put upon Ukraine by the other parties to the agreement uh, to respect the undertaking uh, of a grant of autonomy. <laughs> In 2012, uh, Ukraine adopted a law which gave the status of a regional language to the Russian language. But in 2018, a Ukrainian court ruled that the law was unconstitutional. And in the following year, Ukraine's parliament adopted a new language law, which made the use of the Ukrainian language compulsory in the work of many public authorities in political campaigning, in the educational system, in book publishing, book distribution, and printed mass media. And this was a very significant uh, restraint on the use of the Russian language within Ukraine. As many of us have noted, uh, there is open celebration within Ukraine, officially sanctioned celebration of the legacy of Nazi collaborator uh, Stepan Bandera. Uh, in December 2008 for, uh, 2018, for example, the Ukrainian parliament adopted a law declaring January 1st as a national day of commemoration for Bandera. Uh, our armies, our militaries have been training neo-Nazis in Ukraine. Uh, last year, the Ottawa Citizen exposed the fact that Canadian military trainers had gone to Ukraine and were giving training to members of the neo-Nazi Azov Battalion. And then subsequently, the Ottawa Citizen uncovered facts which showed that the Canadian military uh, was concerned that this would come to the attention of the public, not that the training had actually occurred. That wasn't the concern. The concern on the part of senior leaders of the Canadian military was that people find out about it. Uh, of course, this did not escape the attention of the Russian government or the Russian people themselves. Then you have massive weapons transfers to Ukraine by NATO. You have the shelling of the Donbass by the Ukrainian military since 2015, which has killed thousands of people. And in February of this year, uh, in the days leading up to the Russian invasion, the Ukrainian military uh, greatly intensified its shelling of the Donbass, as was noted at the time, uh, by international observers in the region. 
And so I say that an honest appraisal of the historical record leads inexorably to the conclusion that NATO provoked this war. Now, as I mentioned, the second reality, in my opinion, uh, that must underlie any intelligent and humane policy response to the war is that Ukraine is very unlikely to win this war. And why do I say that? First of all, let's look at the size of the respective countries and economies. Uh, Russia has a population in excess of 140 million people. The pre-war population of Ukraine was approximately 44 million people, and uh, something in the range, according to UN estimates, of 8 million people have left the country. And of course, these populations, the militaries can draw upon in order to mobilize and expand the military forces. In that regard, Russia has an enormous advantage. Uh, secondly, access to energy. Russia, for purposes of this war, has a virtually inexhaustible supply of the energy that's needed to uh, operate and sustain a large-scale mechanized army. Uh, Ukraine has very little energy. Uh, and as I'm going to discuss in a moment, uh, its energy capacity is being greatly diminished by the day. Uh, third, the size of the respective militaries. The, you know, the, the Russians have one of the world's most formidable navies, which they're using extensively in the Black Sea in this conflict. Uh, Ukraine has no navy to speak of. Uh, Ukraine's navy uh, air forces have been decimated and were much smaller than those of Russia at the beginning of the war. Russia has nuclear weapons. Ukraine does not, and Russia does regard this as an existential threat to the country, um, putting us all at risk, obviously. Uh, Russia has hypersonic precision-guided missiles, uh, which no Western military has. Ukraine doesn't have them, and not only does no Western military have these types of weapons, but our air defense systems, even the best of them, are incapable of stopping uh, the hypersonic missiles at the disposal of the Russian military. Uh, there are logistical challenges confronting Ukraine. Its weaponry now is coming principally from the United States. So that weaponry has to be transported across the Atlantic and then by land into Western Ukraine, whereas the battlefield is just a short drive from the border with Russia. And so supplying the military forces on the Russian side is much less logistically challenging than it is uh, to supply and arm the Ukrainian military. And, and uh, Finally, uh, we should take note of the fact, and this is, I think, uh, extensively documented, that much of the population in the areas that are now controlled by Russia are, is in fact sympathetic to Russia uh, because they're Russian speakers, they're ethnically Russian. <laughs> and, and that would make it challenging uh, for, for that and a host of reasons. It would be challenging for uh, Ukraine to both recover those lands and to maintain uh, stabilized and peaceful control over those lands uh, on a long-term basis. Now, as has been noted, in, in October, there were quite significant and impressive battlefield gains by the Ukrainian military. Uh, but despite those gains, it remained true that Russia uh, was in control of a number of cities, major Ukrainian cities that it was not in control of before the conflict, before the invasion, uh, including uh, Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, Mariupol and Kherson. Uh, it's never lost control of these cities, and there's no serious threat, perhaps with the exception of Kherson, to them losing control. Uh, they maintained, despite the Ukrainian advances on the battlefield, a land bridge to Crimea, which was a critically important strategic objective. They maintained control over the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant, which is the largest power plant in Europe, and supplied uh, to Ukraine up to 25% of the country's electricity needs before the war. Uh, of course, they've maintained control over Crimea. Uh, and in addition, since these gains, these battlefield gains in October, uh, all uh, you know, objective accounts suggest that the, the front line has stabilized. The Ukrainian advances have been halted. In some areas, the Russians are in fact effectively counterattacking. And perhaps most importantly of all, since these gains uh, were experienced by the Ukrainian military, uh, Russia has systematically degraded the electricity grid of, of the Ukrainian uh, power system. Of course, this, by the way, is something that uh, the United States forces did at the very beginning of their invasion of Iraq. Uh, the Russians, for whatever reason, waited several months into the conflict before they seriously attempted to degrade the electricity grid. But it's eminently clear that they are both now willing and able to do it. And uh, recently, a Ukrainian government official uh, conceded that uh, the system has lost somewhere in the range of 40% of its capacity. 
Um, we are heading into winter. Ukraine has a real winter, a serious winter, a very difficult winter. How is the Ukrainian state going to survive? How is the government going to sustain uh, the livability of uh, the cities of Ukraine and the countryside of Ukraine if the electricity grid is not functioning anywhere near to its total capacity? This is a humanitarian crisis of mammoth proportions that is unfolding before our very eyes. And the only way to stop it effectively is to bring an end to this war. Now, how would one do that? Well, one has to be, I think, realistic about the realities on the ground. Um, I believe that we should seriously contemplate concessions, and there should be concessions on both sides. That We've been hearing from the, Z the Zelensky government, from the United States government, that a precondition to any negotiations is that Russian forces depart Ukraine entirely, including Crimea. Uh, anyone who thinks that that is a realistic possibility is frankly living on planet Mars. No Russian leader, it's not just Vladimir Putin, no Russian leader would ever agree to that. Any Russian leader who did that would incur, would incur the, ma the massive wrath of the Russian population because Russia has paid a steep price for these gains. Many lives have been lost uh, on the Russian side. Uh, devastating sanctions were imposed upon the Russian economy. And although Russia has held up fairly well under those sanctions, it still has caused significant hardship. The Russian people simply, uh, the majority of them, would not countenance a situation in which the Russian forces leave entirely Ukraine without any kind of agreement in place as to what is going to happen in the future. Uh, you know, not just because there have been losses on the Russian side, not just because Russia has paid a price for this war, but also because there are people there of Russian ethnicity and Russian speakers who many people in Russia believe would be placed at great risk if they lost the protection of the Russian military. So this is just not, it's simply not a realistic demand. Any government that says that Russia must leave entirely the territory of Ukraine as a precondition in negotiation is guaranteeing that there will be no negotiated peace. Uh, and, you know, I think that the a proper way to approach this is to ask for an immediate ceasefire to see if the Russians will agree to a temporary and immediate ceasefire, sit down at the table and put on the table the following uh, issues. The first one is trading land for peace. And, you know, many people will say, and I understand the position that this would uh, effectively reward aggression. Well, I, I would hasten to point out that we have been telling the Palestinian people, we in the West have been telling the Palestinian people for decades, I'm one of those persons, by the way, that they should trade land for peace. They cannot win that conflict militarily with, with Israel. And even if they end up with a minority of the land, even if they were to get a state that's based upon the 1967 borders, which would be a very inequitable uh, allocation of the land as between Palestinians and Israelis, given the history of the, the conflict and the history of Palestine, I think they should take that deal. They'll, they'll have a sovereign country. They will have peace for their people. Over time, they may be able to repair relations with Israel, maybe even achieve a higher degree of economic integration than they ever imagined possible. Whereas the continuation of the conflict, it will only lead to misery and suffering for the Palestinian people. Well, that's the situation confronting U Ukraine today. If it doesn't trade land for peace, I, 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 my fear is that the country will be obliterated. And I think we're watching the obliteration of the country right now before our very eyes. Secondly, Ukraine's government will need to deal with the problem of neo-Nazism in the country. There's absolutely no reason why these neo-Nazi groups, groups should not be disbanded. You know, Greece had, uh, up until about 2016, uh, the, one of the largest and most virulent neo-Nazi parties in Europe. Uh, it was called Golden Dawn. The Greek authorities charged the leaders of that party uh, with uh, engaging in a criminal conspiracy. Uh, which involved, amongst other things, uh, the murder of immigrants. This is, by the way, these are atrocities which the Ukrainian far right has also engaged in. And uh, the leaders of the party were convicted, and Golden Dawn has simply been effaced from the political scene in, <laughs> in Greece. There's no reason why that can't be done in Ukraine with the support of Western countries, and there's no reason why we should oppose it. It would be good for all of us if neo-Nazism were defeated in Ukraine and wherever it rears its ugly head. Uh, a third issue that people should talk about is reparations. And I note in that regard that uh, the West has frozen something in the range of about 300 billion of uh, US dollars of central bank, Russian central bank assets. Those monies 
should be put to use in the reconstruction of Ukraine, principally the areas uh, uh, that, uh, that have been on the front line of the battle. Uh, but the entire country should benefit from uh, massive uh, financial and economic support from the Russian state for the reconstruction of the country and the creation of a possibility for uh, a decent living standards for the Ukrainian people. And finally, uh, Ukraine should accept uh, that it's not going to be a member of NATO. I think the reality is that it will not be a member of NATO, whether it formally accepts that by means of a treaty or not. It seems inconceivable now that that could possibly happen, given the state of the battle uh, and the, 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 the hostilities between Russia and the Ukrainian government. And if it were uh, to be neutral, uh, that, as other military experts have noted, would actually be to the benefit of Europe because it would create a buffer between uh, the Russian state and the Russian military forces on the one hand and NATO's military forces on the other. It would not enhance the security of Europe, uh, of the European peoples or of the world for there to be year after year after year Russian and NATO forces facing each other only miles away from each other on the border between Ukraine and Russia. What is in all of our interests interest is that there be a neutral buffer there. And there's, added, there's ample historical precedent for this in the post-World War II period. When you look at, uh, for example, what Finland did up until its recent request to join NATO and also the status of Austria. So if we do this, if we get to the negotiating table and if all sides are willing to take account of the realities, how we got here, and they have a good faith willingness to engage in meaningful concessions on both sides, this can be resolved peacefully, I believe. But whether that or not that it will ultimately be true, one thing is for sure, if you believe in peace, if you believe in global stability, if you want to minimize the risk of nuclear war, we should make every effort. We should at least try. And there has been no serious effort since peace talks fell apart in April uh, for any kind of a negotiated peace. Uh, so those are my comments, and I look forward to a uh, discussion of these issues with you. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you so much. Um, so that concludes our presentations, and we're going to be moving on to the Q&A portion of the evening. Thank you again, Dimitri, for that really critical, very, very clear overview, and for really underscoring the causes of this war, our interference, role, and uh, for such a human perspective and being willing to to provide real solutions. So you can follow Dimitri's writing uh, and activism at uh, dimitrilascaris.org. And I put that in the chat as well. So I do see that we have quite a few questions here. So I think um, given our time restraints, I'm gonna get right to it. Um, we have a quick question from Evelyn who wants to know if there are any relevant articles um, by Dimitri. Um, I did point, uh, point people to dimitrilascaris.org, but Dimitri, is there anywhere else that people can go to Read some relevant articles. It's untight. Um, excuse me. Uh, I yeah, on my website dimitrilascaris.org, I've probably written far more articles about this war than uh, is good for my health over the last eight months. Uh, and I, I touch on a range of subjects, including NATO admission, the state of the battlefield, uh, NATO complicity. So I, you can find them there. And also, Canadian Dimension has published a number of those articles as well. Great, so I'll put the link to Canadian Dimension in the chat for people. All right, so um, Michael wants to know whether uh, our guests believe that the US, and I think I'll add to that Canada, has any interest in diplomacy or negotiations. Medea, what are your thoughts on that? As I said As I in my said talk, talk it's oh, you'll, have to, you'll have to mute oh. either your phone, phone, or your phone or one or the other, but your internet does seem pretty stable. Oh, well, let's keep with the phone. <laughs> yeah, um, the the uh, position of the US government has been not to talk. Uh, they say that talks are necessary, but at the right time. And as Dimitri so clearly uh, outlined, when is the right time? If you think it's really possible for it, Ukraine to claw back every inch of land, that Russia or Russian uh, supported forces have, uh, then they'll never be the right time for talks. Uh, there have been talks between the Secretary of Defense, uh, Lloyd Austin, and his counterpart in Russia, but they are very limited and don't have to do with 
finding a solution to uh, this war. Uh, and um, I think that um, Anthony Blinken, who is the Secretary of State, should be the one that is involved in talks. So not only has he not uh, been talking to his counterpart, uh, I think their um, message to Zelensky has been one of don't talk either. And, you know, we've both mentioned how the goalpost has changed so much when Zelensky at one point made it clear that he was knew that, that Ukraine had to give up on the dream of joining NATO. And let's remember when he first ran for president, he ran on a peace platform that he was going to talk to the uh, heads of the breakaway republics, and he was going to implement those Minsk Accords. Uh, so I think there's um, uh, not only a lack of interest in talks right now from the uh, U.S. and Canadian governments, but they have also torpedoed uh, the possibility of talks by Ukraine. Dimitri, what are your thoughts on this? And also um, to add to that, I'm wondering what, what are the NDP and Green Party positions on the conflict? Um, you know, I, I think I mentioned when I was uh, making my main comments that uh, there, the two parties, the belligerents were on the verge of a peace deal uh, in March and April, which did not involve, as I understand it, uh, anywhere near the kind of territorial concessions that Russia would likely demand now. Uh, so they did not involve, as I understand it, uh, territorial concessions with respect to the Zaporozhye region or the Kherson region, uh, but only with respect to Crimea and Donbass, where the Russian speakers are most heavily concentrated. Um, but uh, the Ukrainian media reported at the time that Boris Johnson uh, went to Ukraine and met with Zelensky when he was on the verge of signing this agreement and uh, told him, A, that uh, the Western powers, Britain and the United States, would not support the agreement. Uh, and secondly, that uh, they were prepared to massively increase weapons supplies to Ukraine and that Ukraine should fight on. And at that point, the talks fell apart. And what has happened since then? What's happened since then is that far more people have died. The infrastructure is being destroyed and Russia occupies uh, more territory in the South than it did at that moment. There seems to be absolutely no appetite on the part of Western governments uh, to uh, seek a peace with Russia. And you know, unless they're willing to support a peace, the, the practical reality, I mean, the Ukrainian government is basically now just an arm of the US government. It cannot survive without US military and economic aid. It's entirely dependent upon the US government for its existence and its power. And in those circumstances, the US government will necessarily play a decisive role in whether the, the country will sue for peace. But they don't want that because their goal isn't peace. Their goal is to weaken Russia. So to my mind, uh, where we have to, how we deal with this problem is we have to revive the anti-war movement in the West, which is very weak right now and has been, uh, you know, I'm very disappointed to say that the anti-war movement has been AWOL, and so too has the climate movement, which used to understand intimately well the uh, inextricably intimate relationship between peace and sustainability. You cannot have sustainability without peace. Where is the climate movement? You mentioned the NDP and the Green Party. As far as I know, the NDP is fully on board with the Trudeau government's approach to this war, which is a complete and utter disaster for the Ukrainian people and is threatening us all with nuclear holocaust. Uh, the Green Party, to its credit, uh, way back early in the year, shortly after the invasion, put out a statement where it did call for negotiations uh, and recognized to some degree NATO complicity in this uh, horrible war. Uh, but uh, since the leadership contest began, uh, two months ago, I recently wrote an article about this. Not one of the six contestants, not a single one, as far as I can tell, has called publicly for a diplomatic push to resolve this war. Uh, and of course, the Green Party in Germany, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say as a Green, is one of the most warmongering, belligerent parties on the continent at this moment. And uh, it seems absolutely hell-bent on uh, continuing with this conflict until you know Ukraine is utterly destroyed. On the uh, on the subject of nuclear holocaust, we did get a question submitted in advance. Um, are NATO countries not afraid of nuclear war? Uh, somebody asked. And then, uh, real sort of related to this, uh, Kumri uh, in the uh, in the chat asks, 
I'm curious about why countries bordering Russia would want NATO to join, because if Russia bombed them with nuclear weapons, wouldn't Russia be fatally irradiated and vice versa? So, I mean, my question really is, are, is, the, is, is NATO, are NATO countries, Canada, the US, are they not afraid of nuclear war, this nuclear war that we're so, so concerned with ourselves? And I pose this question to Medea and, and to Dimitri, both of you. It's um, interesting that the only time that President Biden has mentioned the uh, possibility of nuclear Armageddon wasn't giving a policy speech. It was at a fundraiser for the Democratic Party. And uh, it was certainly not followed by, and because of the possibility of a nuclear Armageddon, we are therefore uh, nothing like that. Um, there, uh, un there have been, uh, um, I mean, those of us who have studied the nuclear issue are terrified by this. And we go back to the 60th anniversary of the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis when we saw the, the US and Russia on the verge of a nuclear war and uh, with missiles pointed at the United States from 90 miles from our border. Uh, luckily at that time, there were two uh, heads of state, Nikita Khrushchev and John F. Kennedy, who realized that the future of the world was in their hands and that they had to communicate. And an interesting, uh, well, two things. One is uh, the American people thought uh, it was the U.S. tough stand that made the Russians stand down because secretly the negotiation was a compromise on both sides where the U.S. said it would uh, take its um, uh, weapons out of Turkey if the Russians took theirs out of Cuba. So compromise. And in fact, the next year when John F. Kennedy was giving a speech, he said uh, that nuclear powers must avoid a confrontation uh, where uh, they are left with either a humiliating retreat or the use of a nuclear weapon. And that is exactly where uh, the NATO countries are trying to push Russia right now. Um, I'll just end by saying that um, many uh, people in the uh, Bush administration are saying that it's terrible that Russia keeps using nuclear weapons as a threat, but then they also say that he's just bluffing. And recently at a speech he gave, he uh, lowered the heat by saying that Russia uh, would not be using a nuclear weapon. On the other hand, um, they say that, that uh, Putin is a madman and you can't trust him at all. Uh, and so why wouldn't you then be really concerned about trying to negotiate? So I think they've gone around and around in all kinds of different positions, but it gets back to the issue that they think he is bluffing and therefore they're willing to put the entire world at risk to keep this war going. Dimitri, your thoughts? Yeah, the question, as I recall, Bianca, was, are these countries afraid? I think it depends on what you mean yeah. by countries. Is there, is there a real fear of, of yeah. nuclear war, of nuclear holocaust? Because it does seem like our, our leaders are, are kind of taking us to the brink. And, and if that's what you're talking about, the leaders, I would say these people are lunatic psychopaths and they're going to get us all killed, to be perfectly blunt about it. You know, the, the United States government in 2002 uh, withdrew the United States under the Bush administration from the anti-ballistic missile treaty. This was a cornerstone of nuclear disarmament, uh, the nuclear disarmament regime. And then in 2018, the Trump administration withdrew the United States from the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, another cornerstone of the nuclear disarmament routine, or, or regime. And also in that same year, the Trump administration withdrew uh, the United States from the JCPOA, the, which is known as the Iran nuclear deal, even though the IAEA had certified that Iran was complying with the deal. Uh, as far as I can tell, with possible exception of some senior people within the US military, the United States government uh, just is willing to roll the dice with the future of humanity in order to achieve its larger geopolitical objectives. And its larger geopolitical objectives, I I'm sorry to say this, but you you'd have to be smoking dope if you believe that it's democracy and human rights in Ukraine. I mean, really, the United States government is concerned about democracy and human rights in foreign countries. Since when was that the case? What is going on here is that the United States is trying to undermine, weaken, and contain, uh, which is a euphemism basically for every form of belligerence imaginable, the two countries in this world who are most capable of standing up to the will of the US government. And those two countries are Russia and China. 
uh, and they are hell bent on maintaining their global hegemony at any cost. And they are, in fact, willing uh, to play literally Russian roulette with the lives of all human beings on this planet in order to achieve that objective. Oh, terrifying stuff. On a lighter note, um, RP wants to know if there will be a recording of this event. Yes, there will be, RP. Um, going back to what you were saying, Dimitri, about um, sort of uh, belligerence, um, we have a question from Russell, from Justin, um, who wants to know, he says, the U.S. have habitually aligned themselves with terrorist or fascistic groups and proxy wars to destabilize countries. Can you speak to your opinion of how multipolar world might or might not counteract U.S.? dominance and hegemony and Al Alan Silverman I'm just going to bunch his question in with it because I think it's it's relevant there he wants to know what is the significance of China's declaration that uh, no party to the conflict should use uh, nuclear weapons so maybe you can start uh with uh with Justin's question which is directed at Dimitri but feel free to jump in Medea if you have uh, thoughts as well look I I have no illusions that a multipolar world uh, would be a highly imperfect world uh, you know, uh, there's lots you can criticize in both the Russian and Chinese governments and giving them the ability or them acquiring the ability to stand up to U.S. hegemony and actually to pursue their own sovereign course of action will not solve the world's problems, but it will create a more peaceful world. The United States will be required to negotiate uh, re resolutions of differences, economic differences, military differences, uh, and, you know, I'm a big believer in the principle, the, uh, the maxim that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And we've seen what absolute power has done since 1991, since the fall of the Soviet Union. How has the United States behaved in this in, in, in that time frame? It's become the great destroyer of nations. The one thing that the U.S. military seems to excel at nowadays is leaving countries lying in smoking ruins. Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, Libya, Syria. And if we let it continue this way, you know, every country that happens to try to pursue its own sovereign course of action is going to end up being obliterated by the U.S. military. The only way to stop this is to create a system of multipolarity. So while I have no illusions about the imperfections of that system, in my opinion, it would be far better than unchallenged U.S. global hegemony. Thank you, Dimitri. Do you have uh, thoughts on that, Medea? Well, here, here, I'm, I'm delighted the way that you... Um, have posed it, Dimitri, and I do think that uh, there are is that this particular war right now um, will lead to more possibilities of countries getting off of the dollar. The fact that Russia has to sell its energy somewhere else and is uh, making con countries buy them in rubles, uh, and that China is so powerful now. Uh, its currency will eventually uh, be one that will be part of the um, financial transactions internationally. Um, we also see it's not only U.S. military intervention, but it's U.S. economic warfare and the cavalier way that the United States is using its uh, power economically to impose these brutal sanctions on countries from uh, from Cuba to Venezuela to uh, Syria, Nicaragua, Iran. We just had the vote two days ago at the United Nations where the, the Cuban resolution against the U.S. policy was 185 nations to two, the two being uh, Israel and the United States and the two abstentions being Brazil and Ukraine. Um, shows that there's a repudiation even among the very close allies of the United States to this kind of economic warfare. And I think the um, way that the U.S. has gone about both militarizing its foreign policy and uh, using sanctions as an arm of foreign policy uh, is uh, building up the alternatives like the, the BRICS, um, the, you know, the uh, alliance that is uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and now uh, a number of other large countries are trying to join the BRICS. Um, the alternatives are cropping up. As Dimitri said, um, they will be and they are very imperfect, uh, but any way that we can decrease the power of the United States is going to be to the uh, benefit of the world community. Thank you, Medea. 
So we have a few questions about the um, specifics of the, the Nord Stream. Michael wants to know whether um, our panelists could talk a little bit about the Nord Stream pipeline sabotage and its implications. And Hans wants to know if there is a link between the bombing of Nord Stream and subsequent uh, Russian targeting of Ukraine's electricity grid. So some specific questions there. Would either of you like to tackle uh, either of those questions? Um, I'd be happy to start if, if you, I wrote up an article about this recently as I had a lot to say about the subject, so it's kind of at my fingertips, but I, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I can't say that there's definitive proof <laughs> that one or more NATO militaries blew up the Nord Stream pipelines, but I think in the realm of the real world, <laughs> I do try to, you know, uh, view uh, uh, view global conflict through the prism of reality, facts and evidence, uh, it's virtually inconceivable that Russia blew up this pipeline. I mean, it's just to find that laughable. Russia had absolutely no reason to blow up its own pipeline, one in which it had uh, invested billions of dollars, by the way, because all it had to do if it wanted to use energy as a weapon was turn off the gas. That's all it had to do. And as long as it had the possibility of turning the taps back on, it had leverage over Germany. It had leverage over Europe. It could say, look, here's the carrot. The carrot is, if you sue for peace and you make concessions, we're going to supply you, as we've been doing for decades, huge amounts of cheap Russian gas. If you don't, we're turning off the tap. With the, with, with, with the Nord Stream pipelines made non-functional, the carrot is gone. So it's completely irrational for Russia to blow up its own pipeline. By contrast, U.S. leaders including Victoria Nuland, Joe Biden, Anthony Blinken, have been saying for years that they absolutely despise the Nord Stream pipeline. And at the beginning of this year, Biden said with Olaf Scholz, the hapless Olaf Scholz standing right beside him in a press conference, we will bring Nord Stream to an end if Russia invades Ukraine. And a reporter said to Biden, with Olaf Scholz standing, this is the most unbelievable thing, you know, well, how are you gonna do that? Because this is partly owned by Germany. You know, and Germany is an ally. And Biden just smiled and completely ignored that question and said, trust me, we will bring it to an end. I mean, what more proof do you need? Uh, and, and, and the last thing I want to say about this subject uh, is that recently Sweden, which is conducting some kind of an investigation of this and is well placed to do so because of the, the site of the sabotage, uh, said that it wasn't going to disclose what it has found for national security reasons. It apparently has come to a conclusion about who did this or is likely to have done it, and it won't tell us. Does anybody think that if it was Russia, that Sweden would say, we're not going to tell you for national security reasons that Russia did it? I mean, come on. Uh, so, you know, my view is it's very likely to have been one or more NATO militaries and extremely unlikely that Russia did it. And let's just add that um, Putin has said that it was the UK that did it, uh, of course, with the help of the US. Um, but uh, they are gathering more and more evidence, and I think we'll see that uh, as um, in the future. Thank you. So Nino would like to know, um, Nino asks, we know that Turkey has tried hard to mediate between Putin and Zelensky. How realistic is Erdogan's ability and interest to resolve the conflict? What's your reading? Do either of you have a take on this? You want to go first, Medea? I took the last couple. <laughs> well, I think Erdogan was uh, spot on when he was mediating the conflict at the end of uh, March, beginning of April. And um, the, the fact that there was a tentative agreement that was reached was something that was uh, very, um, uh, it, it, it put the spotlight on Erdogan as a, a mediator. Uh, unfortunately, that fell apart, but they, Turkey is still mediating uh, Turkey was helpful for getting Russia back into the grain deal when it just pulled out and got back in. Uh, Turkey has been helpful in some of the uh, prisoner swaps that have been happening. Uh, but there are other leaders that can and, and have been and should be involved. I think the Secretary General of the United Nations has been really excellent on this. Um, there have been people from the Vatican, given that the, po the Pope has uh, been quite good on this as well. Um, the uh, president of Mexico was proposing a group that would include uh, the head of India because India has been trying very hard not to 
uh, uh, not to choose sides and said that it's the only side that it wants is the side of peace. Um, so there are many leaders out there uh, who can and uh, in some instances are playing important roles. But if you have the uh, U.S. saying that it doesn't want to negotiate, if it is giving Ukraine endless weapons, which are a disincentive to negotiate, uh, it's hard to to see how they can get them to the table. So um, we have a question from Cheryl about sanctions. Um, Cheryl wants to know, is there evidence that sanctions against Russia are, are hurting Russia's economy at all? Um, and if you have any other thoughts on sanctions at all on Russia, I'm sure our audience would be interested to know. I'll start with you, Dimitri. Uh, sure. I mean, even the Russian government uh, has admitted that uh, this has caused damage to the Russian economy. Uh, you know, there's been a quite significant contraction. Again, Russian government admits it, but a serious economic contraction, although it appears that that's uh, the recession within Russia is coming to an end or at least being mitigated. Uh, for a period of time, a very short period of time, the ruble, the ruble plummeted against the U.S. dollar. But now the, the ruble has become, and I think even it was The Economist admitted this, the ruble is like the strongest currency in the world over the past uh, several months. Um, so certainly, this has had uh, very significant impacts in terms of inflation in Russia. It's quite elevated, which has forced the central bank uh, to raise its prime interest rate. I think it's now in the high single digits, much higher than it is in the West, uh, although they are apparently they feel comfortable enough to start bringing it down. Uh, so there have been negative impacts. There's no question about it. But Russia is largely compensated for this by switching you know, the sale of its commodities away from Europe and to India and China, which are obviously two gigantic markets uh, for Russian commodities. There's their exports to China and India, and it's very notable and important that both of those countries have decided they are not going to play ball with the West on sanctions. Uh, but uh, they, those two countries have largely compensated for uh, the damage that otherwise would have been done to the Russian economy. And by contrast, Germany is being deindustrialized before our very eyes. Mm. You know, it's the, the 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 levels of inflation, the cost of energy is soaring in that country. The reason why the German economic model was so successful uh, since the creation of the eurozone is largely because of uh, two things. One is cheap Russian gas. Uh, well, three things. The other is they suppressed the wages of workers, and then demanded that the rest of Europe do that too. German workers, I'm talking about. And third is exports to huge Eastern markets, particularly China. Well, now they're taking away the, the cheap Russian gas is gone, and the and the Americans are pressuring the Germans uh, to greatly diminish, if not eliminate altogether, their trade with China. And so the German economy is it's it's again. I, some days I wake up and I look at what's happened. I just shake my head in disbelief. German yeah, leaders. There's, a, there's an attendee who's asking why are European leaders so enthusiastically destroying their own economies? Because they're vassals. These people exist to serve the interests of the American hegemon. They do not, Ursula von der Leyen doesn't care about the European people, couldn't care less. Josep Borrell flushes them down the toilet. Boris Johnson, then Liz Truss, Olaf Scholz. These people are nothing but vassals. It's astonishing what they're doing to the people of Europe. I, I can't believe that Europeans haven't risen up in mass revolt, but that might well happen as the winter unfolds. Well, on the subject of revolt, think, oh, go ahead, Medea. No, go ahead. Maybe your question will get into it. No, no, I was going to move in another direction. I'd love to hear what you have to say. I was going to say that um, that we in the U.S. and probably in Canada are not hearing about a lot of the demonstrations that are happening in Europe, uh, but it is quite. Um, remarkable that uh, we see the demonstrations being called by mostly the right-wing parties, and we see right-wing parties coming to power, like in Sweden and in Italy. And I think as the Western countries and, and our own countries uh, keep ignoring the effects that this war has on working class people, uh, there will there will be blowback. Um, we feel in the U.S. that this is really going to harm the Democratic Party, and that if the war drags on for the next two years, it could make a difference in who wins the elections in the United States. 
And Medea, you had mentioned the letter that was signed by 30 progressive Congress people calling for negotiations. And John wants to know um, why, I mean, you touched upon this a bit, but maybe you could elaborate. Why was it withdrawn? Okay. Um, uh, and do you have any idea what forced them to back down? Um, he says, I don't understand how, how this part the party line of command works. Why, why do you think that uh, yes. to withdraw it? Yeah, they withdrew it because uh, elections were coming up just less than two weeks away. Uh, the Democratic Party leadership came down on them like a ton of bricks saying, you know, how dare you show division in the party at a time when we're trying to show strength. Uh, and uh, also the uh, people who signed themselves, um, they started getting cold feet. I think they were getting some uh, um, uh, pressure from uh, their, uh, in some places from their base, but it really was coming from the top. And uh, so they started pulling their names off and coming up with all kinds of excuses saying, well, I signed it back in the summer when it started to circulate and it looked like Russia was going to win this war. And so that's why I want to talk. But now that it looks like Ukraine is going to win this war, um, there's no sense talking. And, um, you know, silly kind of things like that. Um, so uh, I, I, I say that um, it wouldn't have been so egregiously um, slapped back if it had come out after the midterm elections on November 8th. But I think there still would have been a lot of pushback for not following the party line. And so much of foreign policy is about party politics uh, in um, our countries that were there a Republican in the White House, I think you get a lot of Democrats questioning this policy, but because it's a Democrat, uh, the Democrats are supposed to march in line. Roger wants to know, um, he's, Roger says, nowadays, if you urge your government to call for a ceasefire, you're called a Putin sy sympathizer. He's trying to understand the reasons for this and says, where's the moral outrage? Nuclear war could be at hand. Why the silence, especially on the left? Um, do, do either of you know why, why there has been so much silence? I mean, you both talked about the fact that there, there hasn't been much um, and, the, and the weakness of the anti-war movement. Um, do you have any further elaborations on why the, why the silence? What are some of the factors? Well, I, this, the, uh, you know, there's a massive, you know, wave of McCarthyism sweeping over the West. We've seen this play before. You know, they said some similar things when uh, when people were were arguing against the war in Iraq. You know, Saddam Hussein is the next Hitler. We're going in and we're going to, you know, uh, take down this mortal threat to humanity and anybody who gets in our way is a weak kneed cowardly appeaser and uh, you know is jeopardizing the future of our children and all the rest of it. We've seen this McCarthyism before. It's not new. What is new, in my opinion, at least in my lifetime, is its intensity. I've never seen anything like this. And I think that that's a reflection of the fact that um, the stakes are so high. We're not just talking about you know eliminating from the Middle East uh, some disobedient dictator like Saddam Hussein, who's getting in the way of the US government's agenda. We are talking about global hegemony. That's what we're talking about. This is an existential threat, not to the people of the West, uh, but the rise of China and Russia is an existential threat to US government dominance. That's what it is. And so the stakes are so high that they've taken McCarthyism to a whole new level. And I'm sad to say that there have been far too people, few people on the left who have been willing to take the abuse. It ain't easy. It's hard. It's really difficult to see your name dragged through the mud every day, you know, on social media because you're arguing for peace. But if you care about the future of our children, I'm afraid people, we just have to do it. We have to put up with the smears and do the best that we can to counteract them with logic and facts. Medea, your Let thought? me just say that the role of the media has just been despicable in this. Um, not only is it so uh, propagandistic, but uh, it, is, uh, it, it is refused to allow a real discussion uh, refuse to give um, 
space to the voices of those who are calling for negotiations, questioning where all those weapons are going, in whose hands do they end up, uh, even when uh, the um, very uh, prestigious academic Jeffrey Sachs uh, managed to get on one TV show and was asked about Nord Stream and who blew it up. And when he said, well, of course, the United States, um, he was immediately shut down and hasn't been back on again. So uh, the media has been terrible. And then, you know, one thing we haven't talked tonight and somebody put in the chat, I see, is the military industrial complex. And it's always hard to know how to talk about this in a way that we don't sound like we are um, paranoid or conspiracy theorists. But um, at least in the United States, it is quite incredible to see the power of that complex that uh, our uh, President Eisenhower at first dubbed the military industrial congressional complex for a real reason. And we're seeing today how the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, comes to us directly from the board of Raytheon, how so many of the people in Congress are either veterans of these wars or go to work for the weapons companies when they leave con Congress, uh, how the money that is sloshing around in our electoral system, so much of that comes from uh, the weapon companies and their lobbies as well. And then the issue of jobs, it's become a real job program to produce all of these weapons. And in every congressional district, you will find some piece of some weapon being produced. And now with Ukraine, it's been great for them because they've used up the stockpiles that the U.S. military has had. And now they're, they're uh, allocating money for uh, weapons that will be built over the next decade. So uh, it really is a, um, uh, both the weapons industry and the energy companies that have so much um, uh, power and have so much influence in how this issue gets portrayed. Thank you, Medea. We have a couple of questions specifically about uh, Canadian politics, which I'm going to direct to Dimitri. Um, Hans uh, says, given the experience of Anjali Apadurai with uh, the BC NDP establishment, is now the time for grassroots of both parties to break rank and merge into a new party, a truly green NDP? And an anonymous attendee says, Dimitri, could you throw your hat into the Green Party leadership race last minute um, so that uh, you're not sabotaged, uh, so that your hypothetical campaign is not sabotaged? Uh, Dimitri, what are your thoughts? Are you are you going to run? And uh, should we have a new party? Uh, the latter part of that question is very easy. I mean, that's whether, even if I wanted to, <laughs> and I don't, <laughs> For a variety of reasons I won't get into, it's simply not possible at this stage. I, I, there's no way, it is, even if I was absolutely determined to do it, that I could enter the race. Uh, in terms of a new party, you know, we've been having a lot of discussion. When I say we, uh, you know, people uh, who worked on my campaign in 2020 for Green Party leader, uh, people who uh, are very upset, people from the NDP very upset with what happened in the BC NDP, which is absolutely scandalous as, as anti-democratic a maneuver as you could possibly imagine. Um, look, they're, they're, they're a, it's a difficult question because on the one hand, the mainstream political parties are to varying degrees failing us miserably and they've been doing it for decades. Uh, it's hard to have confidence, frankly, in any of them uh, to do what's right. Um, but on the other hand, there are formidable obstacles to starting a new political party. And uh, you also are taking the risk of further splintering the left. Um, so I think this is a discussion that should be had. Um, and, you know, I'm a member of an organization called Green Left Canada, and we've been talking internally uh, about organizing, organizing a people's assembly next year, uh, the focus of which would be to determine that very question. Is it time for us to try a new political party? So we've talked a lot about the McCarthyism and how dire the media scape has been. And I want to pivot now because we have quite a few questions about activism. So we, and we're running out of time. So I'm gonna try and put some of these together. Um, Paul wants to know about sort of external activism. Do you have any information about the uh, status of anti-war activists in the Ukraine and Russia, asks Paul. Is there anything to report on the anti-conscription movement uh, in Russia? 
Do either of you know about this or, or have any uh, any insight for our audience? Uh, well, I, it's huge. Go ahead. Okay, me. go ahead, Dimitri. No, I, I really, I, 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 that's a subject that I've seen very little reporting on. Uh, you know, I, I, I probably spend three or four hours a day reading about what's happening in Ukraine and Russia right now because of the stakes. Uh, and I just see almost no mention of that at all. Um, but there's a very good question. Perhaps Medea knows more about it than I do. Medea? Well, yes, uh, we are involved in an international effort to support all of the war resistors in uh, Ukraine, in Russia, and Belarus. Uh, there are great networks that have been set up to try to get them out of their country, to find, to provide financial assistance, to try to find jobs for people, um, a real underground movement. Uh, it's very strong in the case of Russia because there are uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, young men who have left the country. And in the case of Ukraine, uh, there are tens of thousands of people who of uh, males of military age um, who do, have not wanted to fight. It was hard for them to leave the country because um, there's forced conscription. Some of them do manage to leave. Others of them are a part of a, a pacifist or, or a, a conscientious objector movements. Uh, some of them have been beaten, uh, are, are in jail right now. And so it is important to keep strengthening the kind of uh, networks that um, uh, bring us together, not only with the war resistors, but in general, the opposition to war uh, that is in uh, both Russia and Ukraine. And I think it would be exciting to think of a way that we could uh, work together, maybe have some big international gathering where we could meet with each other, uh, but we need to do more to get their voices out. Thank you, Medea. Um, uh, Kushi wants to know, how do we rally people to engage in an anti-war movement in the, in the wake of a huge information war and mainstream media, both corporate and government funded, that perpetuates Western propaganda to a level that we have never seen? What are your thoughts on activism and building uh, an anti-war movement? Do you have any insights for, for us about how, how people can get in the ring? Oh, I think that this, this uh, event that you've organized, Bianca, is a very important part of that answer, the answer to that question, right? We have to be able to have these discussions uh, in order to highlight the grotesque and shameless omissions uh, from the Western mainstream narrative about how we got here and how what is happening on the ground and how we get out of this mess. Uh, so dialogue and having the courage to speak up is very important. Uh, recently, also, you know, uh, a bunch of us, including uh, Eve Engler uh, and other anti-war activists, disrupted an event in Montreal involving Anthony Blinken. You were there, Bianca, and you did a very admirable job <laughs> causing a ruckus. Uh, <laughs> And that got some significant media attention, as you know. There was uh, there was like a four minute report on it uh, by the French language state broadcaster. Uh, there's some tremendous disruption work being done also in the United States. I saw recently that there were anti-war activists at an Obama campaign stop. Um, so this is how we have to break through the barrier of silence and the suppression of evidence. We have to, whatever opportunities we have to alert our fellow citizens to the right reality realities they need to be aware of. Um, we should take those opportunities, do it courageously, and slowly, bit by bit, uh, what I can see, and it's the thing that makes me optimistic, is the public is awakening. Uh, it's happening more in Europe, as Medea mentioned, than you see here in Canada and the United States, but it is happening here in both countries, uh, and that's because of dialogue like the one we're having tonight. Thank you, Dimitri. Medea? Yeah, I would add to that. Um, I mean, I've been doing a 50 city book tour. I'll even uh, be going to um, British Columbia on November 15th. Uh, the the tour um, is on our Code Pink website. Uh, we also have a 20 minute video that's free to download and we're calling on people to use it in house parties, at libraries, uh, other kinds of university events, um, but it's a good basic explanation of what the war is about. 
And I think it's important to uh, educate, educate, educate at this point to get around the uh, disinformation that people have been fed. Uh, the other thing about disruption that Dimitri uh, brings up, I think it is so important, and we have been encouraging it while our members of Congress are at home doing their campaigning uh, at all kinds of stops where they go to be out there calling uh, them out uh, for their, um, their refusal to push for peace talks. And um, then I think there are certain sectors that we can focus on. I think the faith-based sector has not done enough. Uh, we now have a beautiful one, one or two sentence statement that we are getting interfaith groups around the country to sign up on. And um, I think that's also at the Code Pink website, but it's a great thing to go around to uh, churches and ask them to uh, sign on to a statement. Um, and uh, I, I mentioned in my talk, and I think uh, Dimitri, you have as well, how important the role of the environmental movement could and should be. When the war started, I think they were mistakenly thinking that if they joined in the call to boycott Russian energy, this would really speed up the transition to green energy. And uh, what has happened is really that uh, the, the, there's not enough green energy quickly enough to make that happen. And so it sped up the production of dirty energy. So we are trying to get the big environmental groups to uh, sign on to statements, um, recognizing how devastating this is for the environment, both uh, physically as well as the funds that need to be put into addressing the climate crisis. Thank you, Medea. Um, okay, so uh, just gonna take maybe one more question, one or two here. Wendy very quickly wants to know, Dimitri, you had mentioned a gathering that uh, that that could be in the works. Um, Wendy's asking if you could speak for the idea brewing of a gathering of progressives and how this United Front might contribute. Um, could you let us know a little bit about this uh, gathering for anyone who might want to, to be involved with that? Sure. So I kind of touched on it before, you know, uh, the, the, the discussion, there are discussions going on within, I think, a number of left wing organizations uh, in Canada about the subject of a new political party. Uh, in in my case, I think that's Wendy Goldsmith, who's a member with me on the uh, National Council of Green Left Canada. We've started a dialogue with people uh, from across the country, some organizations, uh, people who are, you know, uh, independent. There's some who are politically independent. There's some people from uh, either current or former members of the Communist Party, people who have traditionally supported the NDP. Uh, and, uh, you know, we think we need to, instead of having these kind of ad hoc, splintered, isolated discussions, we want to bring all of these people together in various uh, progressive and left-wing organizations across the country to a People's Assembly sometime next year. Uh, and we would in, we, we we would like to sort of feature there a number of high profile speakers uh, from the left, the international left, uh, and talk you know in a serious uh, and uh, earnest manner about whether or not this is the right course of action for us going forward. Uh, so if you want to know more about this, please feel free to send us an email at Green Left Canada. Uh, we have a website, and uh, we'll keep you in the loop. Thank you. And so my final question is, what, what would meaningful solidarity with Ukraine actually look like? I think meaningful solidarity is to try to stop Ukrainians from being killed. And uh, that is why we're doing this work. Uh, I want to mention a couple of places that people can go as well. And one is peaceinukraine.org. It's a coalition of groups and we have meetings every two weeks to talk about uh, what we can do to build up the movement. And um, also my own organization, codepink.org. Um, so I would say um, uh, reaching out to the Ukrainians who uh, agree that negotiations is the only way to end this war um, making common cause with them and showing our uh, representatives that fighting to the last Ukrainian is not in the interest of Ukraine or the world. And I just want to end by saying sometimes we feel alone and marginalized and fringe and 
as Dimitri said, you know, this happens to us all the time. It's not the first time when we oppose the war in Iraq or Afghanistan or Libya, all of those. And eventually people start coming around and seeing, but also to recognize right now we are by far the global majority when you see uh, what people in big countries like China and India and Indonesia and all of Latin America that is becoming more and more progressive, uh, they are so anxious for everyone to sit down at the negotiating table. So we do represent the global majority. Unfortunately, we have a lot more work to do to get our elected representatives to really represent us. Dimitri. I completely agree with all of those suggestions by Medea. The only thing I would add, you know, and I, I'm sure Mattia agrees with this. I'm sure everybody on this call agrees with this. You know, while I'm opposed to the provision of weaponry to Ukraine, uh, I am absolutely committed and enthusiastic about us providing humanitarian support to the Ukrainian people, both those living uh, in this, what is becoming this hellscape in Ukraine, but also those who have left the country and are refugees. Uh, our country, especially taking in, taking into account its culpability in all of this, we we bear a heavy burden to support the Ukrainian people from a humanitarian perspective. Thank you. I think that's a, a, a beautiful note on which to end. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you, Medea. Thank you for such a lively, important, and also brave discussion. Um, thanks for your tremendous analysis and for your activism. Um, and I think we've all learned a great deal. Um, I can see we had a very lively chat today, a lot of incredible questions. And so to people at home, I say, please do continue to stay informed and stay engaged. So much is at stake. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we will be rebroadcasting this uh, discussion to YouTube and Facebook. Please do share with your friends and allies who you think might be interested in this discussion. Um, and uh, yeah, subscribe to our, our, our channel for, uh, for updates on foreign policy news. Um, and so on and so forth. So thanks again to our panelists. It really, it's truly been a great event. You are both very, very inspiring people. Uh, I feel very lucky to, uh, to be in conversation with you today. Please find out more about the work of Medea and, um, and, and Dimitri at codepink.org and dimitrilascaris.org. Please buy, uh, consider buying Medea's book, uh, War in Ukraine. Um, the, the, uh, the link is in the chat there and I'll also be putting it in the replay. It's been getting great reviews. Uh, be brave, speak out. Let's continue working for peace and opposing war. Uh, peace, everybody. That's it for our event tonight. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been great.